Today we're going to do a watercolor copy of one of John Singer Sargent's most famous paintings. Let's get started. And if you would, please consider leaving me a thumbs up because YouTube loves a thumbs up. If you've been watching my channel, then you know that I call, call, call myself a value-shaped painter. I don't look at the eyes, the nose, the mouth. I don't look at the features. I just look at how light or dark something is. And then I create color dabs and I insert them according to whatever value I, I see. In other words, how light or dark something is. And the way I start is I always put in my darkest darks first. There they are, although they're gonna become darker later. And then I also will put in some Naples yellow in the areas I wanna preserve as being very, very light or possibly white. So that's, that's sort of how I begin every single painting. And then the observation sort of begins. Now, I'm not trying to be a matchy-matchy painter. I'm not trying to exactly copy John Singer Sargent's painting here. What I'm trying to do is use my method or the way I become accustomed to working and applying it to the image that he made. So it's not about copying as much as it is about interpreting. So what I do next is I look at what is what, what's in between. In other words, what are the midtones? And this painting is a lot of midtones. I mean, yes, her hair is extremely dark. Her eyes are dark. Her eyebrows are dark. There's a little dark shadow happening under her nose and to the uh, right side of her face as I look at the image now. But the rest of it, except for the whitest whites, and I don't, because I'm a watercolor painter, I don't have whites. The only way I can have white is to not paint over it, or as I say, drive over it. So I've got to look at midtones. So that means mixing a lot of paint. And so that's what's happening on the upper left-hand corner. I'm mixing paint because I've got midtones to consider. So if everything is going to be mid-toned, the value doesn't really shift that much. I mean, if you squint your eyes from here, you'll see that almost every dab I make, almost, is kind of about the same value or lightness or darkness. So in order to turn the form, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to consider temperature. And temperature meaning how um, bright a color is, meaning towards yellows, oranges, and reds, or how dark something is, and that leans towards blues and purples and, and probably a little bit of dark green as well. And that's what I try to do. I try to stay, that's the challenge here, is how to make a mid-tone painting, knowing you have some lights and you have some darks, because that's really important for any successful painting. But then beyond that, can I control the mid-tones to the extent where they will turn a form, where something will look like it's rounded as an illusion? And in order to do that, I don't want to use any black and I don't want to use anything in terms of neutral. Neutral meaning beige, gray, or tan, you know, the colors that, uh, the colors we typically paint the insides of our homes now that I think of it. <laughs> There's a lot of bland going on out there. But what I wanna do is I wanna have my neutrals have as much color as it's possible to have in them. So the mixtures that I'm making probably, probably, I, get, I know, because I did this, are, have a lot of reds and oranges and violets, but then they're tamped down with their complement which tends to be either a cerulean blue or in this case, sometimes an ultramarine blue. So in other words, I'm playing in the grays. In other words, how much color can I put in my neutrals and still maintain the neutrality? That's kind of the challenge here. And I think that's what he was doing too. Because if you look at his painting, if you look up really, really close, and I haven't seen one in real life, so that would be considerably different. He puts so much color into those skin tones. He's not using white either, so he's creating an illusion as well. But the ability that he has to see is, you know, superior to anything I, I will ever have. But what I learned from this is if you do copy a master, he's already done a lot of the work for you. He's already figured out the color relationships. He's already figured out the value relationships. It's sort of like he's already drawn you a map of what to do. So it's not, it's not nearly as difficult. I shouldn't, I, maybe the word isn't difficult. I would just say it's different from when you're starting your own subject 
and you sort of have no reference to go to from or to other than what's right in front of you. So this is my second pass at it. Now when I, I say pass, what I do as a watercolor painter is I will do at least two passes, meaning the first one establishes everything in and the second one is going to just reinforce decisions I, that I already made. And that's what I'm doing now. So major decisions have been made, but if I don't provide enough of a bridge, then everything will look a little bit fractured. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to figure out what do I need to do in order for this painting not to look like individual parts, not to look like a jigsaw puzzle, but to actually look like a whole image. And in order to do that, what I tend to do is really do a lot of squinting with my eyes. Squint, 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 squint. You have to squint until your face actually hurts. And what I'm looking for here now is adjusting those darks. His darks are so dramatic that it took more than one pass to get to the darkness that I needed to get to. And I didn't anticipate that. Now, I know that an oil painter like John Singer Sargent has the advantage, I don't know, an advantage, this is different, that he can um, paint over something or can come back and make adjustments. And I can't do that. My way of painting is I've got to, I may not get it correct on the first try, but I can always go darker. What I can't do is I can't go lighter. And so I have to sort of tiptoe my way in. And that's what I was doing here. But look, the important thing is looking at the color dabs. It just takes a lot of color dabs. And I probably used all of these. It's the combination of color dabs and squinting in order to just get to the side of your brain that isn't thinking logically, actually isn't thinking at all. It's just processing what's light, what's dark, what's cool, what's warm, what shape is that, how can I make that shape, and does that shape have to be dark or light, does that shape have to be warm or cool. I mean, that's it. It reduces my world to just making those decisions. And when I'm in that world, it's like the happiest place ever. There are no real concerns. There are no appointments. There's nothing but, but making those decisions. And if you've been painting for a while, and if you're watching this, you probably have been painting for a while, what starts to happen is that you intuitively know what to do. You don't even realize that you're doing it. And that is the absolute delight of painting when you, for me, when you see a spot and you can feel how warm or cool it is, and then you look down at your palette and you think, what color spot of value could I put in? What could I put in that would add some spark to that? And that's when I tend to go to cerulean blue. I often see a lot of cerulean blue in black. And that's the last step that I do, that I just insert some color spots of value. So I was pretty pleased with this because um, because I have to admit, I started out having no idea if this was possible to do at all. And I do think that these exercises are going to make my portrait painting better. And I hope they also improve my analysis of Portrait Artist of the Year, which I've been doing on a regular basis. So remember to keep the white to your paper white, your paints wet, mask for value, mix for color. Please join my YouTube channel, and I'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye.